Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could teach the gullible to never be so comfortable with eyes they eat like comfort food? To disregard the bogus claims and pseudo-scientific claims, can you imagine just how much indeed the world would change? No more political predators playing on the populace, but ill some plots to shift and kill Metropolis. No more villains with the title in the Bible, holding phony temper writers like the stuff they teach is vital. Imagine it was normal to have to prove a claim you If folks really feel the shame expressing content that was fake, it's not to say we never make mistakes, it's just to say we go out of our way to show the evidence it takes. Remain skeptical while you travel the world or even stay strapped. We're allowed to get fast. That's what it is, yo. Any reality needs that to help the truth grow. Question every claim, especially the ones you believe in. Remain skeptical while you travel the world or reason. Welcome everyone to this week's edition of Road to Reason, a skeptic's guide to the 21st century. I'm your host Larry Mendoza and with me I have Rob Penzak. Nice to see you guys again. All right, so welcome again. We have a great show today I think. Uh, I'm really excited about it. We have uh, joining us in about 15 or so minutes is going to be Donald Prothero. He's a paleontologist and geologist um, and we will be talking about uh, science and nihilism. Um, the name of the show actually is Reality Check with Donald Prothero, named after his 2013 book Ooh. called Reality Check. There Ooh. it is. Oh, there, you it can is. Get that there you go. For you there. there it is. So uh, we'll have a, a great discussion about uh, climate change denialism, evolution denialism, and things along those lines here in a few minutes. But first of all, let's have some announcements and some news items. I, I do want to, the first thing I want to mention is that we want to congratulate uh, the Center for Inquiry, CFI, and the Richard Dawkins Foundations for Reason and Science for their merger that was announced recently. So basically the way that's going to work, as I understand it, is that uh, CFI will absorb, I guess, um, Richard Dawkins Foundation as a subdivision, and Robin Blumner, who's currently the CEO, uh, or the executive director of the Richard Dawkins Foundation, will be the CEO of CFI in this merger. So congratulations, I think that's gonna be a good thing. I think we're gonna see a lot of good things coming out of that organization, considering it's gonna be the largest uh, secular and, and science and reason organization out there now. Right, so. and these are two big players that we always go to yeah. to sort of look for information, you know, what's in the news, yeah. where it's the science heading. Um, so, yeah, right. it's really exciting to hopefully yep. have them, you know, get some synergy as they, as they pool their resources. Yep. So we'll uh, keep an eye on that. All right, so what All else right. we got? <clears throat> got some yeah, I want to tell you about a couple of programs coming up in Richmond. Um, so I'm starting something called by Saved by Science and working with a couple of organizations there, including Greater Richmond Humanist. Um, we have a few excellent talks. Dave Silverman, president of American Atheist, is going to be there talking on Valentine's Day. Day about fighting God, an atheist manifesto for a religious world. Um, so if you have not had a chance to see Dave speak before, he is a firebrand atheist. Uh, he's also a humanist and is a classical liberal. So there's a lot of things that are said about him that really are not based in reality, which will tie into today's talk. But uh, if you're anywhere in the Richmond area, we'd love to have you come out. It's going to be uh, February 14th, 1 o'clock. And you can go to SaveByScience.com for information on that and where you can get free tickets. On March 6th, Linda Lascola is going to be coming to talk about Caught in the Pulpit um, and the Clergy Project. There'll be a couple other speakers from Richmond down there. And on April 17th, Phil Torres, a philosopher and author of um, the End, What Religion and Science Have to Tell Us About the Apocalypse will be there. So we have a few very interesting programs. And then in May, uh, Dr. Lawrence Krauss will be joining us by Skype. So I would encourage everybody kind of in this general area they can get down to uh, Richmond, you know, if you're and, around and where, here. Where can they go get information again? Uh, you can go to savedbyscience.com or richmondhumanists.org, and we'll have all the information listed there. Good. All right. Also, another uh, quick announcement. I want to remind everyone of the Reason Rally that's coming up uh, in June. I believe it's June, the weekend of June 4th. Uh, be there or be square, I guess. Uh, you're going to miss out. If you're not there, it's going to be big. It's going to be at the Lincoln Memorial, but there'll be events uh, throughout the weekend all over D.C., including a lobby day kind of thing, I think, that they did last time. So uh, make sure you're there. It's going to be good. And this is where people are interested in atheism, secularism. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's going to be um, a gathering science. of uh, Anybody secularists. Anybody critical thinking yeah. motivated, you know, this is going to be a broad event for a lot of people. The biggest gathering of uh, atheists and skeptics, uh, you know, ever. So, um, all right. Uh, one more thing. Actually, a couple more things. I want to mention that um, right now, here, you know, we... we uh, air from uh, Fairfax County Public Access here in Northern Virginia, right in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. And the, three out of the four channels uh, or the shows are um, religious based. So I want to encourage people all over the country to um, build some content, go to your local um, public access station, start a TV show, a radio show, anything, or if you want to make some, build some content, you want to give us some ideas, because I think we're overwhelmingly um, out. I guess, media by mm -hmm. religious organizations. So I think it's important that we really get the local communities involved and start promoting 
uh, what we think is is the best message for um, everything from the truth to morality. So, um, right. and if you put some stuff together, it doesn't even have to be at a public access studio. You right. get your own video camera. You film some interesting yeah. secular news, skeptical news, atheist news. Contact uh, us through our Facebook page. We'll get in touch with you and see if that's something that we can put on the air for you and get you some publicity. Absolutely, absolutely. And then finally, I, I do want to mention one thing about our show. A couple of uh, weeks ago, uh, Stephanie Gutmerson, who is the um, uh, she runs the uh, events plan. She's the events planner for the Richard Dawkins Foundation. She's one of our hosts here um, that comes. And, and uh, a couple weekends ago, I think it was two or three weekends ago, uh, she uh, did a show where they called in a sham um, doctor who claims that uh, um, uh, laser therapy can cure you of all kinds of diseases and, and, and things like that. So they basically, they called the 1-800 number while they were on the show uh, to his office and, and apparently it, it rang over at his house and he answered the phone and was a little bit perturbed that uh, Stephanie called him at home while he was trying to watch football while she was asking him questions about the veracity of deep tissue or, or, or laser um, uh, therapy for, for things like you know, illnesses that he claimed. Well, anyways, to follow that up, he called or he emailed. He's emailed Stephanie now and uh, kind of a little bit perturbed about that and saying, you know, why would you call me at home? And, and Stephanie basically replied, well, why is your 1-800 number uh, going right to your house? But anyway, so this is st now starting a, a back and forth email exchange with Stephanie on her Facebook page. So if you guys are interested in that exchange, go to, to Stephanie's Facebook page and, uh, and check that out because I have a feeling it's going to be quite interesting. So. Uh, yeah. But anyways, okay. Was that a chiropractic or was that a? Uh, it, I, I think they do not chiropractors. Basically, they 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 are uh, they advertise themselves as laser um, just laser therapy, which you know there is some evidence I say, about I've that. Heard chiropractic yeah. advertise on the radio, and they do yeah. everything. It's, it has very little to do right. with their spinal manipulation. So it's right, curious. right. So. Yeah. And right. Stephanie loves to call these sham healers out there, so it's, it's right. great. Well, we'll be so. talking about this a little today, about alternative yeah. medicine, um, the lack of scientific foundation for right. that, and the real harm that it causes. Uh, I actually Absolutely. have a friend who's going through, you know, a family member who's really sick, and is interested in getting their faith healer involved, and it's like, you know, this really does have consequences if it steers right. you away from real medicine or from And that's family. what, the, that's the biggest thing that this guy is doing is on his website, he says that you don't need to go see a doctor, just come to me, I'll fix you with a laser. Yeah. So, anyways. all right. So, and some other right. you know real news to talk about. Um, I'm going to go into the Zika virus is something that has been in the news a lot recently. This is a flavivirus similar to what causes dengue fever. Um, and right now, the World Health Organization is saying that this may end up being worse than Ebola. It's expected to spread through the Americas. Um, one of the consequences is that a large portion of the babies are being born <coughs> with microcephaly, or small heads and small brains. Um, so, you know, this is potentially a really big deal. And why I wanted to bring it up is we have a couple of routes that we can go. We can go the anti-vaccination route and just leave these people to suffer and make sure that we don't, you know, that we just sit here and pray about it. I think there's a contingent of Republicans uh, that are off on their way to South America and see if they can pray away the virus. Or we can have scientists actually start to look for a cure for what's potentially going to be something that's really harmful. And there's different, you know, there's consequences to what you do and what you believe. And it's important that our leadership understand science and embraces science otherwise you know as global warming you know has more and more of an effect and mosquitoes move north this will become part of our problem also instead of just other people somewhere else that we don't care so much about yeah and i, and I also want to mention about this is that the the zika virus is spread through uh, a mosquito now the mosquito is aedes aegypti which is actually uh, you know native to the united states we have these mosquitoes here so uh, right now i think it's moving up from south america on up and and according to world health organization mm -hmm. Um, they expect it to spread all the way up, uh, up and up. It's not, it's not supposed to hit Canada, Canada. Um, as of right now. And, and that's probably because of temperature differences and things like that, where the mosquitoes can't quite mm -hmm. survive. So um, what's interesting is that this ties in not just the science of uh, you know anti-vaccination or, or sham praying to cure, uh, you know, but also global warming and climate change, and that's part of the reason why these emerging diseases are happening too. And, and evolution also, like how this and particular evolution, virus right. mutated and now it's become a real problem. Right, and so there's a lot of, uh, you know, it, this ties in evolution, climate change, you know, the, the whole anti-vax issue, that these are all topics that I think we're gonna touch upon today if we, we have time to touch upon all of them. Okay. Um, so this is an interesting Yeah, and, and it's not critical, it's not even possible for everybody to develop expertise in all these different areas, but it is possible and it's important that everybody develops some critical thinking skills and an appreciation of science so that we approach this in the right way in the first place. We should not be spending resources or time on praying. Right. So, 
All right, we got a couple of minutes left, and uh, just want to mention real quick, um, just a, a quick something that's kind of been bothering me a little bit is about the Richard Dawkins uh, being um, uh, disinvited by the NECSS, which is the Northeast Conference of Science and Skepticism, for a video that he tweeted that um, uh, compared feminists to Islamists. And uh, now, you know, the only thing I, I want to say about that, and I'll keep it short, is that that was done on his personal Twitter. Now, granted, the video may not have been, uh, uh, you know, the most tasteful video, but that was his personal uh, um, Twitter feed. And I know Dawkins has been bash many times for what he posts on Twitter and some of it is you know worthy of being criticized right but I think to, to genuinely disinvite him from a, a, a conference such as that I think is short-sighted because it starts to um, it starts to when people do this and they have a right to do that they can disinvite anybody but to do that starts to uh, we start to question whether uh, famous people like Dawkins or other scientists or other people can't actually even have free speech anymore, whether you agree with it or not. So it's very, it's very troubling that I'm seeing this trend on the left where if they don't like your message, they, they disinvite you from college campuses, from uh, you know, national organizations like this. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important that um, we start to kind of critically analyze these issues and, and be careful about what we do, because we could be right. throwing away the baby with the bathwater. And, and, and if you watch the actual video, even if you find it irritating, it brings up an important point about um, most of us consider ourselves feminists. The, there's a new wave of feminism that is siding with Islamism in some very dangerous ways. There's um, a case with Maryam Namwazi where she was speaking and the Islamic group there, you know, sitting there and just trying to break up the thing and be intimidating and not let her talk. And after that event, after all that disruption, the feminist group and a um, like lesbian, gay LGBT alliance group, group yep. also they both sided with the Islamist group. Despite that, the Islamists you know, preach such dangerous stuff like throwing gay people off rooftops, mm -hmm. throwing acid in women's faces. That's what Dawkins and Sam Harris and a bunch of other people are trying to say is, we want equality for women also, but you and B are bending so far over or backwards to make sure you're not called a racist or an Islamophobe that you're missing some of the really dangerous tenets preached by Islam. And right. So th and, you know, this and, is another and, good case and, where and, you lose and the other thing is, you know, criticizing a religion is not the same thing. And I was going to say this over and over, and many people have. It's not the same thing as criticizing a people. Um, um, and also, one thing I want to do mention is that Richard Dawkins did not know that the video that he posted, uh, the caricature of the feminist, was actually a real person. Once he knew that, and of, apparently this person was threatened with rape and death by men's rights groups and all kinds of stuff, once he knew that, he actually deleted the video and condemned any kind of threat and violence and, and things like that. So that's important to also note. Right. Um, but and anyways, you know, so... And last word I'd say is Steve Novella, they put out some great material yeah, and information, got, and that's another yeah. wonderful group. All right, we're going right, to... Wrap move on. This, yeah, Second question quick. of the week. Yep. I'm going to throw out Bernie Sanders. I um, was asked if he's religious and basically gave somewhat of a pantheist answer. He didn't quite say he's an atheist because I didn't think he thought that would be too harmful. Um, let me see if I have his quote right here. But he basically oh, he's said he's right not here. following. Basically, he says, uh, in a, during an interview, he says, I am not actively involved in organized religion. This is a quote. I think everyone believes in God in their own ways. To me, it means that all of us are connected, all of life is connected, and that we are all tied together. Well, almost like we have a common ancestor. Wow. That's evolution at work there. I think that's why he's person of the week. All right. Joke of the week. Why don't you do your short one, then we'll move on. Okay. So I uh, just want to, our joke of the week is uh, basically that uh, um, I want to mention that when we all die, we're all going to be closer to God because we're also not going to be uh, existing. All right. We thank our producer for that one. We are going to cut away to some public service announcements and be right back with Dr. Donald Prothero. Mm -hmm. Homemade noodles. Oh. Marty, stop it. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. It reminds me. I've been thinking uh, maybe we should try a new form of birth control. I heard about this one. It's called the IUD, intrauterine device. Or we could try the patch on your arm. Actually, I think that one goes on your butt. Bedsider.org has birth control information and a lot more. And it's... What do you think, though? Arm or the butt? There's a lot of tree branches and dry brush over here. We should probably move the bonfire over there. I'm guessing Smokey liked that idea. This is Richard Dawkins. Doing commercials is unfamiliar territory for me, but I'm inviting you to watch Road to Reason, a skeptic's guide to the 21st century, on Fairfax Public Access every Sunday. 
Each week, the hosts tackle wishful thinking, religion, pseudoscience, and the harm they cause, with a combination of facts, humor, and community involvement. They challenge believers to defend their faith and give you, the skeptic, a voice. With live call-ins for viewers and streaming on the World Wide Web, there's never a dull moment. Don't wait. Look at them now on Facebook and YouTube. And remember to watch Road to Reason, a skeptic's guide to the 21st century, or there'll be hell to pay. Body language can tell you all sorts of things. Like someone is having a stroke. Know the sudden signs. Learn fast. Face drooping, arm weakness, speech difficulty. Time to call 911 and get them to a hospital immediately. Learn the body language and spot a stroke fast. A critical thinker is in a frame of mind of always questioning everything, including things they don't necessarily want to question. You may have done some research and satisfied yourself on a position you're sure is right. Good. Now, after a month or two of that, go look at some research that opposes your point of view or challenges the position you've taken. You can even look into it with the idea of poking holes in their arguments if you want, but it would be better to just have an open mind and read it as though you'd never heard or seen anything on the issue before. You may be very surprised what you learn, and if you're doing this right, you will be. Always be open to opposing points of view and counter arguments. That's what critical thinking is all about. And now you know. Hey, welcome back to Road to Reason. So we're going to be joined by Dr. Donald Prothero. He's a geologist and paleontologist. He's also the author of over 35 books and 300 scientific peer-reviewed papers. He's been on uh, major editorial boards for big journals and has been in multiple documentaries. Today we're going to be talking about Reality Check, how science deniers threaten our future. So Dr. Prothero, thank you, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much. All right, let, let's get right into this with the bad stuff first. For people that are not familiar with your work, um, Evolution News, which I assume is a very reputable place, said that in Reality Check, your dogmatic absolutist pronouncements in favor of evolution make you sound a lot like the crackpots, fringe scientists, and pseudoscientists you deeply deplore, and that you seem so self-assured about the inerrancy of your skepticism that you were totally oblivious to this fact. Is um, Evolution News run by Dawkins and Jerry Coyne and other, other evolutionary biologists? No, Evolution News is a uh, sort of a, a sham corporation for another misnamed organization called the Discovery Institute, which was set up in the early 2000s to support the intelligent design creationist movement. And they're pretty much the only real big voice on the web anymore as far as creationism on the web. Uh, they're very active in promoting any kind of creationist thing. And they're also, by the way, big on promoting other right-wing causes, and they're big on climate denial as well. Uh, they're just not, it's, it basically promotes a whole agenda. Uh, so I'm a bete noir as far as the Discovery Institute is concerned. Uh, they don't like me because I've called them out a number of times and, and written very critical things about their, their favorite guys like Stephen Meyer. I've torn his book apart in, in a number of places, and, of course, he didn't like it. And I beat him in a debate once, too, which doesn't sit well with them. So, so basically, it's almost like a badge of honor to uh, be criticized by these yeah. guys, I would imagine. That's right. right. That's right. You know you made it when you get Discovery News uh, criticizing you. That's right. <laughs> that's right. So, so that's I want right. you to tie that into evolution a little bit. You know, I'm sure it's not a mistake that they named themselves Evolution News. What are, you know, the average Internet viewer that doesn't know that much about evolution happens to look that up. What do they need to do so they know that they're not on one of these sham sites? It's very tough because uh, this is a very common strategy uh, that's been around a long time, but even more now in the age of internet and political sham groups and you know various types of uh, astroturf groups that aren't really actually uh, grassroots, but they're funded by big corporations. Is to give yourself a name that sounds innocuous or even sounds uh, very uh, admirable. And yet you have to look really closely to make sure that this group is actually what they claim to be. And so all these anti-science groups out there and alternative medicine groups and so on, they all try to, for example, put on a label that makes them sound like they are scientific or they are really medicine because they know that's what people have come to trust. 
But in reality, of course, you look very closely at what they claim, and then they discover, that in fact, they're just the opposite. Uh, usually, if you read it carefully after a few, uh, few parts of any like, website, you can usually tell what the real agenda is. But a lot of people don't often pick that up. And, of course, the site itself is deliberately mislabeled. It's a classic case of bait and switch. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to point out that you know, that's why you know, we promote oftentimes critical thinking and critical analysis of everything you read. Uh, both from the left and right, just for this very reason, because if you are a good critical uh, uh, thinker, you can actually uh, be able to start discerning, uh, you know, what kind of uh, organizations these are instead of just seeing the the title. Um, you know, and, and as you said, Donald, there's a lot of organizations right there that are using it primarily within the anti-choice movement. They set up these false um, women's clinics, as they call them, to kind of do a bait and switch. Um, for, for women seeking abortions, they're trying to, you know, kind of direct traffic their way. So, yeah, it, it's a problem, and I think people need to be very careful. All right. That's right. It's, it's, it's become part of our political landscape now that uh, there's lots of powerful forces, especially large corporations and so on, which do this uh, as a way to cover their tracks mm -hmm. for what they really want in their agenda to be passed. So they create these groups that look like they're citizen-based, but in fact, they're just a handful of at lobbyists with a mm -hmm. website and a bunch of fake uh, you know, uh, appearance, appearance that looks like they're real when they're in fact entirely astroturfed and they're created by some corporation trying to push an agenda. Right. I, I want to read you another a little clip of part of the, it's not even the criticism, but just to hear the, the verbiage they use where they're saying um, Prothero is so wedded to junk thinking that he says the human tailbone has, no longer has a function. In humans, the coccyx serves important functions. I'm going to skip down. Muscles inserting on the anterior coccyx include the levator ani, which is sometimes considered as several separate muscle parts, including the coccygeus, iliac coccygeus, pubococcygeus muscles, and they go on with, you know, all these polysyllabic medical words. Is that a standard technique where when you have nothing to say that they bury it in this kind of jargon? Um, and also maybe you talk about PhDs in your book, kind of go through what a, a PhD and some of these uh, you know, apologist groups, what credentials uh, they have. Right. In that case, uh, yes, it's very much the case that what you do when you don't understand a subject, you just start quoting a lot of stuff. And oftentimes you completely misuse it, and most lay readers can't tell that they've done so. And for example, saying that the coccyx, which is this very reduced number of tailbones that all humans have, has no function is ridiculous because what they're saying actually is that it's 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 those muscles are still there, but they they the they, their their function is tied when they had a tail, and what we have is just like them. Those muscles are still there, but they're also vestigial. They're not very important, and they don't perform the role they used to perform when we used to have a long tail. So they're they're basically misleading you by you know, uh, quoting anatomy that they do not understand, and that's uh, as as you uh, said in your question, that's a general problem we have with a lot of these pseudoscientists and anti scientists out there, is that what they do is they uh, try to put on the appearance of being really co competent and really scientific. Uh, what I, one of my colleagues and I call credential mongering, very common habit you'll see when you're debating a creationist or reading creationist literature or whatever, as they'll Dwayne Gish, PhD, or Henry Morris, PhD. Yeah. And for me, that's a red flag. The mm -hmm. minute anybody puts PhD at the front of their book or on the cover of their book, it always tells me that they cannot, the book itself does not stand on its own merits, that they have to waive their credential there to intimidate the reader. And what any one of us who've gone through the process of getting a PhD know is, in fact, what happens to get a PhD, you actually become less broadly trained and less uh, interested in many other topics because you have to focus so narrowly on this little narrow mm -hmm. area that you're focused on one little research problem you need to be completely focused on to get your research done and jump through all the right hoops and get published and the result is you often lose a lot of your scientific breadth in the process but it's more important thing to realize the PhD doesn't make you an all-purpose expert you're just an expert on one narrow area that you're trained to, to, to talk about and cut with competence and that in that respect you know, you should be very careful of anyone who says, I'm a PhD, but they're talking in an area they're not trained in. They're no more qualified to talk about that than they are to say, write a symphony or fix an automobile. They're not an expert in every field just because they have a PhD. And so this is something, unfortunately, the public is easily misled by this and cowed by this. Somebody, you know, puts PhD up there, they're intimidated, they don't realize that he's not necessarily smarter than you, they just have a specialized training. Yeah, there's a, um, when I was at, uh, in college, um, when I was getting my master's actually, uh, I started a, uh, a secular group at VCU, Virginia Commonwealth University, and uh, during that time there was a, uh, um, a gynecologist, uh, at, he's in a gynecology department, um, and he's a young earth creationist, and yeah. the, one of the uh, 
uh, uh, Christian groups uh, decided to have a presentation with him on, on basically cosmology. And this guy, you know, PhD, uh, gynecologist, PhD, did research in you know, OBGYN issues. And, but he's out there um, talking about why the Earth can't possibly be as old as yep. scientists say. Right. But he was a doctor, you know, he had a PhD. So, you know, he's, he's credible, clearly. Yeah, I just thought yeah, that was kind of funny. The same is true, and I debated Dwayne Gish, the late Dwayne Gish now, mm -hmm. uh, who was the leading creationist yeah. debater in the 70s, 80s, oh, yeah. and part of the 90s. Uh, when I debated him in Purdue in 1983, uh, the thing was, of course, his entire presentation consists of topics he is not trained to talk about. Mm -hmm. He got a PhD in biochemistry from Berkeley way back in the 50s and hadn't published any science or anything like that any time since then. He's entirely been doing these uh, these dog and pony shows with these memorized punchlines that he didn't fully understand. And of course, the, he was mostly talking about fossils and he couldn't tell one bone from another and no idea what, how fossils <laughs> were formed. And yet, his audience doesn't know any better because he shows pretty slides of dinosaurs. Right. And so that's well, the problem. Were you hit with the Gish Gallop then? <laughs> the oh, famous Gish Gallop? It's the same. But in the case of this, I, I didn't, you know, I, we, enough of us knew Gish's uh, strategy pretty well. Right. And I, in fact, went to see him about a week before the actual debate. He was at the University of Illinois. This is when I lived in Illinois. And taught at Knox College in Galesburg. Uh, I watched him give his unopposed version of that same talk mm. to a University of Illinois audience that with no attendance fee, so lots of skeptics and lots of scientists showed up and they booed and hissed him all the way through. But then what, what it did for me is I saw his presentation, I knew his order of slides, mm -hmm. and he never changes a thing. He's a robot. Right. right. Every right. well, he was a robot. Every every slide talk is exactly the same. He says the same thing no matter what his opponent has said or what his opponent does. He ignores entirely what his opponent does, which is not a real debate strategy. You're supposed to actually address your opponent's arguments, but he says the same routine memorized pattern. And so I knew exactly what he was going to do. And in the particular debate I did at Purdue in October 1983, I had set up so that um, I got the first half hour and the third half hour, the first two hours. Mm -hmm. And then we had another hour and a half of questions. So it was a, almost a four-hour debate. Wow. And okay. what I did was then I organized my presentation to first quickly introduce the nature of science. But then I got to all the arguments I knew he would cover in his first hour and debunked them before he got to them. <laughs> and nobody noticed. Wow. The audience wow. was all church people from around yeah. that part of Indiana. They were all bussed in. On a Saturday night, they charge something like ten bucks a head for this event. On a Saturday night, hmm. and, and you know how a college campus is. On a Saturday oh, yeah. night, there's thousands of choices of things to do, right. most of which are free. And of course, you won't go to a debate, create, creationist debate unless you're very interested in it, which usually means you're a creationist. Mm -hmm. And so, I was the only one there on my side with wow. five, five students from Knox College who drove over with me from Illinois. That was it. I was an entirely hostile audience. And so I basically approached the debate as you can't possibly win this debate, right? Because your audience is already on his side to start with. So I just didn't care. I did what right. I said what I wanted to say and did what I wanted to do. And mostly I just poked fun at him and, and tried not to be too serious. But I also did my own gallop. I hit all those arguments he was going to hit before I hit him and hit him fast and then moved on. I can talk faster than he can. And mm -hmm. so I'm just interested to see. And I actually got people come up to me at the end and say, oh, you changed my mind. So oh, wow. it worked to, to some extent, but I wasn't expecting much because it, it's, yeah. it's basically a dog and pony show. It's sure. not, not the way real science is conducted. Uh, so I was going to say real quick, uh, you know, all debates, uh, in my opinion, these types of debates, they're all about, they're not really about the truth. They're not about who's right, who's wrong. It's all really a, uh, it's a chess game. It's, it's who can debate better and it has nothing to do whatsoever with the truth. And oftentimes I see Christians winning debates all the time and knowing very well that they're not, the truth isn't behind them. So, so when you do something like that, how do you, you know, do you look at the person you're debating differently than the audience? You know, some people are just ignorant but not malicious. Some people are fully aware that they're lying and continue to spew the lies any, anyway. Or some people really have enough confirmation bias, even amongst the apologists, I suppose, that they believe what they're saying. Do, have you developed a sense of, you know, if you think the people at the top know that they're lying and do it anyways, or if they're genuinely misinformed? And do you approach innocent, ignorant pe people in a different way if they just haven't had a chance to learn it? Well, I assume that most of the audience at a debate like that one I did with Gish or any courageous audience, most of them are just basically ignorant. They've been raised in one kind of a church their entire life. They've only heard one side of the story, and what they've heard about evolution is 100% wrong because it's, it's filtered through creationist distortion. So that it's to some extent I cannot, you know, you know per, uh, feel bad uh, to treat them harsh because I know they don't know better. 
and it's basically ignorance and it's very hard often to reach those people because they're not interested in learning something else mm -hmm. the people who are do the debating are a different story and I've always and I wrote about it in my previous evolution book and I'm going to do a new edition of it talk about it some more I mean to some extent they must know that what they're saying is wrong and the Gish himself for example has been corrected many times in his debates where someone showed he was false and he had to back down in that particular instance and say well I'm mistaken what he does however is that the, the, if he goes to a totally different audience the next night who didn't see his performance the previous night back when they didn't record these things and they're not on YouTube right. and then he would go right back to his old argument without changing it without okay? changing it and so it's clear to me that he I mean, he clearly knows he's wrong, but he doesn't give a damn, okay? Because to him, I think it's more about proselytizing. It's more about sure. converting people. It's a sermon, basically, is what it is. Well, that's, it does change. That's what they all do. William Lane Craig, uh, you know, um, uh, right. name a million. They all, they all do this. They, they rehash the same arguments. They repackage right. them sometimes to make it sound like brand new ideas. But at the end of the day, they're all the same rehashed classical right. and evidential or um, you know, presuppositional apologetics and it doesn't matter how many times they're uh, debunked. But I, I had a question. That's all they have and there isn't anything new. Th exactly. There's Science no nothing new. They, new stuff. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Which is, you know, that's so they have to repackage it. But let me ask a question. So as a scientist, um, do you believe, um, and we can get into a little story that you have about Bill Nye and Ken Ham, do you believe scientists have a responsibility to debate these uh, these people. Uh, do you think this is something that a lot of scientists, more scientists, should get, be involved and be active uh, in doing? Right. Well, it's it's changed in my own career. I've seen the change. Uh, when I was trained in the 70s and 80s, it was considered bad form as a scientist to actually get involved in policy debates or politics at all. And a lot of people uh, looked on you as being sort of losing your scientific objectivity by stepping outside the realm of what science says to uh, arguing about policy, about what society should do based on what science says. Uh, and I know Carl Sagan, for example, took a lot of heat in the 1980s when he stood up against uh, Reagan and the Star Wars program and so on uh, because he was doing both political advocacy but it was based on scientific stuff that he himself actually had partially been responsible for. Uh, but the times have changed. Uh, we now have one political party in this country which is firmly against science in many ways, especially in that it has active, uh, you know, its major players, all of them are active climate deniers and most of them are also creationists and some of them are also anti-vaxxers as well we've got problems with that as well and they have now gone to attacking science and the scientific institution and the way science is funded and tried to sort of get bait and switch us with some of these uh, crackpot alternative scientists that they are trying to promote and so science itself is now under attack in this country and its, it's credibility and its standing with American people is being lambasted almost daily on Fox News or I should say Fox Propaganda Ministry is the proper name for them uh, and this is a big problem because now scientists aren't in a position where they have the luxury of just stepping back and saying, oh, well, that's politics, that's uh, the you know, public sphere, I'm not interested. We are now under attack, and mm -hmm. to some extent, we have no choice but to at least stand up in the appropriate venues, mm -hmm. and speak to issues, if not directly to political parties. Uh, all the major, for example, the major geological and uh, climatological organizations in the country, as well as AAAS, American Social Advancement of Science, mm -hmm. all the biggest scientific organizations in the country have all spoken out on climate change and made it clear that it's a 99% consensus opinion among scientists in this world now. Uh, and of course, the same is true for evolution. We've had to basically use all of our scientific uh, you know, community to speak out about it. But as you point out, it gets, it's more about reaching people, which isn't very well done by just you know, policy statements from the AAAS. Mm -hmm. And for those, it's been a challenge because uh, you know, a lot of people don't like stepping outside the ivory tower. And a lot mm -hmm. of people really don't have the time or interest. It's already a very time consuming thing to be a scientist in the first place and to stay on top of the, the grant game and to keep funding coming and all the rest and to, to put time into things like going out and speaking out against uh, political uh, interference in science is very cons time consuming Excellent. and it can often damage your ability to do what you need to do as a scientist. So these are all tough issues, but you'll see more and more now scientists are taking a side and, and certainly when it comes to voting politically, they're all pretty much, you know, voting on the scientific side of the right, issue. Right. Well, absolutely. And I think, uh, and you made a couple points there, so I do want to mention a couple of things. So um, do you think the best venue, though, to approach um, this issue of, you know, scientists being attacked is through uh, debates like, for example, and we can talk a little bit about the Ken Ham 
versus Bill Nye debate. Is that right. or, or, or is it better? Is the energy better spent uh, actually lobbying Congress and uh, you know actually hitting the people that matter, or, or do we need both? Um, yeah, one yeah, of the, what, one, real quick, I just want to mention, because one of the things, um, when I worked uh, for the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, I had asked um, Sean Carroll, who's now the uh, 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 Vice President for Education of, of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, uh, if he watched uh, the Bill Nike and Ham debate. His response to me was, I did not watch it on doctor's orders. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, so, uh, you know, I mean, I, what do you think about, I mean, what's the best venue? What, what should we well, be doing here? The Bill Nye Ken Ham debate is almost two years now. Yeah, yeah, two years, about two years ago. Yeah. Um, I helped coach Bill on that actually. Right. Bill's a good friend of mine, and uh, Michael Sherman and I helped coach him. So did NCSE up in Oakland. Uh, they they spent a bunch of time with him, getting him prepared. But that was a rare exception to the rule that you should never debate these guys because Bill is in a different position from the rest of us. He's already a public figure. You already had a, a love, beloved uh, you know audience on the side uh, that was sympathetic to him. And he was he's, he's very good on his feet. He's very smart. He knows his way to do, you know, very non-threatening ways of getting science interesting to most people and not be uh, easily ruffled. So he was in a position where he could do something I couldn't do. You know, mm -hmm. I know a lot more about many sciences than Bill does, but I'm also get passionate about my science to the degree that I might get uh, uh, worked up and probably lose my cool and then lose the debate. Bill did the smart <laughs> thing. He just stuck to his, pro his program. He did not lose his cool when he was challenged. He made it basically clear that he was talking about common sense stuff. Mm -hmm. And by the end, he got Ken Ham all tied up in knots just by not following mm -hmm. Ken Ham's attempt to do a gish gallop. Right. And uh, you notice, for example, in the end, especially when the questions came in, I know that Ken Ham tried to stack that audience like, like the one I faced oh, yeah. with entirely his own people. But somehow some of Bill Nye's fans got in there when they first opened the, the website for tickets because they were cheering him at the beginning, they cheered him at the end, and then they asked Ken Ham questions or threw him off balance. Like, would there be any evidence whatsoever that would cause you to doubt your creationist story? And Ken said no. Right, right, yeah. It rules out everything yep. he says is being taken yeah. seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, and then another question caught him admitting that he didn't take every single word of the Bible literally because some things obviously can't be taken literally, which also completely undermines the basic tenets of his faith. That he oh, absolutely, to. especially the Ken Ham type of faith where he really yeah. does believe that the Bible is literal because if it's not, everything that's, right. that's built upon, that's right. say, the Genesis story, falls apart. I mean, that's, that's, right. that's basic. Uh, so those, to me and to any audience not already on Kim's side, those are fatal. Mm -hmm. admissions in his part. I mean, they basically beat his ass in that de debate for that reason. Mm -hmm. And so in that case, because Bill had goodwill coming in and Bill built more goodwill coming out of that, uh, it really, I think, was a victory for us, for the, you know, the audience that did see it, which apparently wasn't medical doctors by the HMI, but lots and lots. What was that, 400,000 people watching mm -hmm. it live, and it's sure. been by millions of repeat views since then. Ken Ham, I, by the way, was trying to use it as a device to raise money for his organization, because mm -hmm. his uh, creation museum is losing money, mm -hmm. and now he's gambled his entire organization and basically mortgaged it to build this ARC attraction that's right. going on now, which is all built by junk bonds, which means yep. if the ARC attraction is built and then it loses money, his whole organization is going to collapse. Oh, yeah. So, so speaking of junk bonds, I'll be sure when that day happens. Yeah. I, was, I think Jerry Coyne made the point that, you know, once you look at population genetics, it means that the best that we can possibly say about Christianity is that Christ came back and died for a metaphor. You know, once you accept that, we never had two people. Um, I'd like you to sort of, and we want to get to climate change in just a minute. First, if you can take a step back and just talk about science versus pseudoscience and genuine skepticism versus, right. you know, denialism. Right. Yes. Uh, science is defined by not by the white lab coat or anything you wear or you, or you have in your equipment or anything like that. It's defined by approach to the world where we're always looking for testable hypotheses, testable explanations of the world. And the fundamental thing that differentiates science from pretty much anything else, and Karl Popper, the philosopher, pointed this out decades ago, was that science is about proving things wrong, not mm -hmm. proving them right. And so, for example, you can make a generalization like all swans are white. But no number of white swans will ever prove that statement true. But one black swan, and there are black swans in Australia, proves it false. Right. And that's what science is about. You test ideas, you try to shoot them down, not prove them. 
Mm -hmm. So scientists, when they're talking among other scientists and they're aware of their own science, philosophy of science, they don't use the word truth, they don't use the word prove, right. they don't use those words at all because they don't belong in science. Everything is tentative, everything is subject to further testing. At some point, you have so much evidence supporting an idea like evolution or gravity or Big Bang cosmology that it is such so well corroborated, that's as close as we'll say to being proved, corroborated, that we can talk about it as, as being essentially true for all layman's purposes, and then we use layman's language and call it true. And this is also where the, the issue with the word theory. A theory is an extremely well-supported idea in the world of science. But to the popular uh, lingo, a theory is a crazy notion like why JFK was assassinated. And so, of course, creationists play on that misuse of the word theory all the time when they attack uh, science. So they, the, that's part of it. Then skepticism versus what we see in the denialist community. Skeptic does not mean that you're always criticizing and always doubting at all times. And sooner or later, if enough evidence piles up that you have to accept something because there's no evidence against it that's credible and all the evidence is in favor of it, like evolution, like climate change, then you do what the scientific community does and you accept the idea, at least provisionally, until more data comes in. But what climate deniers do is they deny the, the evidence and then they stop even trying to look at evidence. And then no matter how much more evidence piles up, they do not change their positions. That's denialism. That's a dogmatic viewpoint. That's not a skeptical viewpoint. So, so just to, to clarify and to summarize, the difference between skepticism and denialism is the fact that a skeptic will change his mind, his or her mind, based right. on un irrefutable evidence, whereas a denialist will call himself a skeptic because it sounds good, but will uh, refuse to change his or her mind uh, even with irrefutable evidence. Right, or, or even a preponderance of the evidence mm -hmm. might be a better, you know, it depends on right. what you're dealing sure, with. But. Sure, sure. Yeah. And that's it. And it's, it's the same kind of belief system that drives religion, right? No amount right. of evidence changes a religious person's viewpoint by itself. Well, can have Although proved that. Evidence causes them to doubt and eventually they start to become open-minded and change their viewpoint. But when you try to, for example, argue with a religious person, as all the people watching this show probably know, you end up usually with a brick wall because argument and evidence is not what it's about. It's about salvation. It's about personal feelings. It's about feeling part of your community. Those are things which keep people in religion, not evidence. Mm -hmm. Yep, so uh, yeah, and that's uh, something that I think a lot of uh, uh, these apologists also, they like to, to confuse their flock uh, because their flock doesn't understand these concepts. They, they, they really do not. And it's becoming clear and clear to me uh, every day we see uh, uh, these politicians that are now, these aren't just people now that are, by the way, uh, voting. These are people that have been <laughs> elected. That's the scary part. Yep. So That's the scary part, yeah. Um, and you know, so I also want to jump over and talk about merchants of doubt a little bit. You can maybe tie this into climate change if you'd like. Uh, there, you know, Naomi Oreskes and Eric Conway, they run through a whole host of tactics that are used mm -hmm. generally by the right wing. Um, and they run through a whole host of environmental issues where they use this playbook over and over. So maybe you can right. tell some of those basic tactics and then how those apply to climate change. Yeah, uh, I actually call it in my book and in the lectures I give when I talk about my book, the Holocaust Deniers Playbook, mm -hmm. because it's a classic case. I mean, most people on this planet accept that the Holocaust is real and that something in the order of six million Jews and thousands of Poles and all the rest died thanks to Nazis. But there is a movement out there of Holocaust denial, which is usually a large sort of neo-Nazi anti-Semitic group behind it. But it does everything it can to ape and mimic true scholarship but with the agenda of, of trying to disprove the idea that, in fact, the millions of Jews died in the, in the Holocaust. And you can't, it's hard for people today to imagine this is even possible because even the Nazis themselves bragged about what they did. They all wrote it down, they documented it, and we still have lots of survivors alive, although they're disappearing day by day and there are fewer and fewer of them now. Uh, and so it's hard to imagine anybody could deny something so obvious, but you know it's not a hard thing to do, especially uh, right now, for example, in the country of Iran, it's the official state position, right? The entire country is Holocaust deniers because of the conflict between Jews and, and Muslims in that part of the world. So it can be a very large part of a, even a whole community of people who accept something as ridiculous as that. And in any case, what happens is they, they have a playbook that the creationists had early in their history as well, and now all other groups that want to deny some obvious reality adopt, which is a, basically what you know, Oreskes and Conway called a merchants of doubt strategy, which is when you do not have evidence on your side, when scientific opinion is against you, what you do 
is you create doubt, you create a smoke screen, you do whatever you can to pick at little nitpicking differences between what scientists say. You try to criticize an individual scientist whether they make a mistake. Like uh, one scientist or one piece of evidence is enough to entirely shoot down the entire scientific enterprise. And all that, do all that does is create in people's mind that the idea of what, whatever the scientific community says, therefore, is not certain enough for them to act upon it. But science is not about certainty. Right. And it's can, always about probabilities, and people don't understand that. We say it's something 99% probable. Well, you wouldn't jump off a cliff and say, well, I'm going to gamble on that 1% that it's not true. Okay, can you talk about the specific role that think tanks play in this and like the purposeful right. generation of uh, you know, misinformation? Yeah, Rescue and Conway actually did a lot of uh, detective work in tracking where these came from. The George Marshall Institute, for example, is founded by a group of physicists and others who had been cold warriors that actually worked in various types of arm programs like Edward Teller and, and uh, Robert Jastra worked as physicists in the, arm, in the arms race. And then when this Cold War ended, they had to decide what to do with themselves. So they ended up deciding their goal instead was to defend any form of capitalism and attack any kind of environmentalism that threatened complete and untrammeled capitalism. So they switched their, their goal from attacking uh, Russian and Soviet missiles to attacking ca anything that uh, threatened capitalism. And so they, with a lot of other organizations like the Cato Institute and so on, the libertarian groups, plus these groups that are directly mouthpieces from the energy industries like Heartland Institute, which is basically a Koch brothers creation to look like it's actually a think tank, but it's actually run by people paid directly by Coke and used to be by Exxon Mobil and well. These people then create these, you know, what sound like legitimate think tanks, you know, like Rand Institute, which does not have a political bias, but they're all basically propaganda arms for whoever backs them, whether it's the right-wing arms industry or the right-wing uh, energy industries, the people with the real money who are trying to protect their position. And Oreskes and Conway point a very interesting parallel, not just to Holocaust deniers, but the one that is most remarkable is the history of tobacco mm -hmm. use. And the story, they start with the beginning, which the tobacco industry knew in the 1950s their product was deadly. Uh, they also knew with their own scientists in their own laboratories what, the, what did, it did cause cancer. Mm -hmm. And then there's a famous um, memo from a PR meeting they had in the 1950s with a, a PR firm called Hill and Knowlton, where the famous quote from that is, doubt is our product. PR firms st established early in their thing that their whole strategy would be create a smoke screen of doubt right. and that they would have all sorts of uh, fake studies out there and scientists who are in their pay and all this stuff to create enough doubt that people wouldn't be willing to move against tobacco. And they succeeded in doing that for 50 years yes. because it wasn't until around right around the year 2000 and finally enough studies had accumulated, enough people had come out against tobacco lobby that they were able to push the tobacco lobby to the point where finally they had been caught in their own lies. And they even had to be, as a some of you might remember that you remember the year 2000, they were actually put in front of a committee in Congress and prosecuted under the RICO, uh, mm -hmm. Racketeering Corrupt mm -hmm. Organization, which was built to use to break down the mafia. It yes. took the RICO, RICO Act yeah. to get mm -hmm. the tobacco uh, companies, uh, executives, to finally perjure themselves in front of Congress. And then finally now they, they're in retreat, at least in this country. They're still big in the rest of the world. Good, yeah. Um, what do you think about the media's role in all this? Is there some responsibility on the media's part to educate themselves? So instead of just saying, these people say this thing, they say that, let's watch them debate and fight it out. Isn't this entertaining? You That's know, right. That's right. Yeah, the very big problem is that the media in the old days uh, was very much a media that had a lot of things like fact checking going on before it was, you know, they, when there used to be three networks and three networks only had the three news shows, they had fact checkers, they had to try to be balanced between both sides of the argument. They tended not to be partisan. And what ended up happening was, of course, during the deregulation of the airwaves, now we have the hundreds of news sources, almost none of them better worry about fact checking anymore because many of them are, in fact, just propaganda ministries. And what we end up with is a situation where what little bit of objectivity journalism has left is misguided now because they're under the impression that they should always give both sides of a story hearing. But we don't give flat earthers equal hearing with those of us who accept the world is round and, mm -hmm. and respect to that grapper last week, B.O.B., who claims the earth is flat and Neil deGrasse Tyson uh, uh, pawned him pretty well. Yeah. Uh, 
Mm. There's, uh, we don't give flat earthers equal time. We don't give any of these other weird science deniers equal time on our network TV. Mm -hmm. And so the same should be said for anything else that science has established beyond reasonable doubt, including, you know, the Big Bang and evolution and climate change. We don't give them equal time because it's not an argument anymore in science. It's only an argument in the policy arena and not because of scientific arguments, but because of policy. There's a good uh, episode, if you've ever watched uh, the show that uh, John Oliver does uh, on HBO, beautiful, beautiful episode episode he did where he talked about climate deniers and he talked about how ridiculous it was that 50 percent of americans weren't convinced that climate denial uh, climate change is real and he said well it's the same as it's uh, it's irrelevant what americans think because you don't whether americans think that two plus two is five does not change that two plus two is four mm -hmm. and so then to the end of the episode just to jump the punchline he said well when you see it on the media however what you always see is some joe from a climate denier versus bill nye and it was mm -hmm. Bill Nye versus this guy, and Bill Nye versus that person, and so on. And so for his final segment, he had Bill Nye, who lives there in New York, and showed up. <laughs> Bill told me that story. I last minute got called to show up. And, and 96 other extras. So they had, okay, we'll have two climate deniers here, three climate deniers here, representing the 3% who don't accept climate change, and Bill Nye, and 96 others. <laughs> and they yeah. all these guys, extras That's in right. white lab coats, flooded into his studio. Yeah, I remember that, yeah. Fit them all in, and they all had loud argument. That's how he wrapped the show. That, that that was a great, great move, yeah. I don't and, and doesn't media, like general media, have yeah. an ethical responsibility to do that? Because that's how you connect with the vast majority of like non-scientifically mm -hmm. based people. They get that. They yeah. see, oh, it's all of the scientists versus one screwball. Exactly. Then that's great. And that, that, but that's a problem because the media, uh, we already have media which tell nothing but lies, like the Fox well, News sure. problem. Right. Know? And we have media which are trying to be balanced, but they re don't realize that by doing so, they're, they're giving some kind of a crackpot idea equal time with real science. Mm -hmm. And so we, 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 we don't see that the, the, the media has lost its spine, right? The media is now a prisoner of ratings and prisoner of political movements, and they don't really have any, you know, there's no more Edward R. Murrows or Charles, Walter Cronkite's out there who right. tell the Americans the truth. Well, keep in mind also most of our media is corporate anyway, so you know it's it's, right. uh, it's for profit and for and what they want to do is uh, promote uh, you know as viewers and you know it's the same thing with like Discovery Channel, National Geographic, all these you know they started making all these reality based shows that completely right. are devoid of any science whatsoever. It's because that's what sells, and so it's pretty sad that even our science channels now are uh, full of uh, crack pottery. Um, right. yeah, anyway. I've, I've blogged about that a bunch. The, the, the basically, it goes back again to the deregulation of the 80s when Reagan's uh, group deregulated the airwaves. Mm -hmm. They start out on the right track, and then, so Golf Channel had its goal, and History Channel had its goal, and Discovery right. Channel. One of them was actually backed by, by, by uh, NASA at one time. Mm -hmm. But then, as the time time progressed, they all went with what's called through mission drift, mm -hmm. where they discovered that it, they were not getting enough ratings because ratings is all that matters to them now. They're all commercial right. stations, and they weren't getting the ratings by putting in boring science uh, documentaries. So they ended up all converging on reality TV. Yep. And now there's no history left on the History Channel. Yep. And there's no science left on Learning Channel. And Discovery Channel is just about no science left. And what they do put on a lot of is pseudoscience, especially yep. aliens, UFOs, oh, yeah. big all the alien stuff, all yeah. garbage. You know. The, the, the whole uh, mermaid uh, documentary yeah, they the did. Mermaid documentary, the fake great white shark, uh, the, uh, the, the Galadon. Which yeah, Megalodon, yeah. The Bigfoot. Uh, I mean, it's just unbelievable to me. I want to I just real quick uh, reintroduce the audience. If you're, if you're just tuning in, we do have about five minutes left. But we are talking with Donald, Dr. Donald Prothero about um, his book, Reality Check, where we're discussing science denialism. Um, so, you know, check out his book if you get a chance. But let me ask you about um, what does your critical thinking make you think about the efficacy of unregulated capitalism. You know, when we look at the cigarette companies, now that they know all of their data and it's out, are still killing five to six million people around the world annually. You know, new Holocaust every year. You have the oil companies are destroying the climate for all of posterity. What do you think scientists, I understand speaking outside of a PhD is one thing, but just in critical thinking, do we have enough evidence mounting to say that we need something different than letting the corporations run the show? I agree. Um, I mean, I'm 
clearly on the liberal side of the spectrum, and I agree the government has a role because we have seen what happens with unrestrained capitalism, and it isn't good for the planet or for people. Uh, and so our, our, whole, our whole political spectrum has shifted back and forth over the years, you know, in the, the FDR days and the New Deal, of course, unrestrained capitalism brought the Great Depression, so we went to the other direction and went to greater regulation, and then we went away from that, and then in the 60s we had more more regulation than we've had since the Reagan years, sort of a, a slide back to let capitalists out of uh, have what they're doing. I think that day is probably going to swing the other way pretty soon. But in some instances, I think it's already happened. Uh, I mean, for example, ExxonMobil now has been exposed, as some of you know, uh, they, their, their memos and their research, yep. mm -hmm. they, their inside people did in the 80s and earlier, mm -hmm. showing that they actually squelched their own research, just like tobacco companies used to sure. do. Uh, has pretty much given them no cover anymore, and now they're openly saying that they are going to support climate change agendas, so, and they're no longer going to put money behind uh, the the Coke back groups like Hartman Institute, which is a good sign. I think you know the oil companies themselves know because as a, as a you know, geologist worked in oil. Uh, they know that oil is running out and will be very scarce within 50 years mm -hmm. and that they have to have a new business model. Dude. And if they don't get into some other forms of energy themselves, they will be extinct. Because most of the rest of America business is already thinking to the future and what the climate change means for their business models, not pretending to deny it. And it's only people like the Cokes who have also political uh, axe to grind as well as a lot of oil interests that are still fighting with, with denialism. Mm -hmm. So I think denialism is on its way out. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at or at least the climate denialism. Look at what happened with the agreements now that just happened in yeah, Paris. That's right. Uh, all the countries of the world are on board, including the U.S. Uh, and we have, you know, except for the uh, U.S., all the other climate deniers are out of political power. Abbott lost power in Australia. Harper's government mm -hmm. was overthrown in Canada. So only the U American GOP is the only major politically powerful climate denial yeah. group left. I, I was going to say, it's only the American GOP <laughs> out of the whole we're world. Number, but we're number one. That is, okay. yeah, the only the only political organization left that's denying. Yeah. And um, we may see at the end of November 2016 that that too will no longer be a problem. So. We, we can only hope. Do, do you think it would make any sense to pursue like criminal prosecutions? Uh, you know, is there enough evidence to at least shift the conversation from is climate change real to this is real, these people have been obfuscating this for decades, this is the monumental cost in life and wealth. Even yeah. if that case didn't get won, would that be a way to shift it? And for, you know, anti-vax movement, for a bunch of the denialist things you talk about in your book, is, is that something you think there's a, a path forward to prosecute? Well, yeah, there are organizations already getting ready to prosecute ExxonMobil. So Good. that, because they're, they're, they're the paper trails now everywhere. So that's going to probably happen, and it's going to give ExxonMobil a big black eye for a long time, which is part of the reason they've quickly caved and yeah. now are no longer backing the climate deniers. They've got to now shift their focus to being very green and looking as good as possible so they can make the best situation out of these lawsuits for their bad past sure. deeds. Uh, the same could be done. It's just a question, and again, it takes uh, usually a, an attorney general of a state or someone who wants to crusade on this thing to do this to uh, uh, these other organizations which are har harming the public good by mm -hmm. promoting anti-science. And so, you know, there are instances where, for example, they, uh, groups of climate of anti-vaxxers have been prosecuted and yep. groups of where, That's right. where uh, chiropractors have been prosecuted for their harm for, harm for people. Uh, in California, we do it by initiative. And we passed mm -hmm. initiative now, so as you know, since the last election year in California, the, the anti-vaxxers no longer have any influence. They no longer have the freedom to deny taking their kids to public, or to, to deny to not vaccinating their kids before they take it to public school. There are no exceptions anymore, except for real medical reasons. Okay. And so that has pretty much uh, uh, changed we everything here in California. The anti-vaxxers lost out. They tried to uh, get an initiative on our Donald, ballot. I just want to let you know we have less than about 45 seconds. Um, so I'm going to cut you off right there, but one real quick thing in 10 seconds or less, the best evidence for evolution. What is it? Fossil record. Fossil uh, record, okay. Fossil record shows life has evolved without any question. Is that, is that your bias as a paleontologist? <laughs> So, but we want to thank you, Donald, for, for being us. I mean, I know it's a short time, but we will probably have you back on again and continue this wonderful conversation. Right. But we are running and out of time. And take a look at this book. Take a look at the reviews. It covers a tremendous amount of material. I really encourage people to check this out. Uh, and reality does matter. Yeah. So, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thank reality you much. Reality has consequences. That's right. Absolutely. And uh, don't forget to check us out on YouTube and Facebook and everything, and we'll catch you next time. See you guys. Thank you very much, guys. Yep. Bye.